This is Healthcare Now Radio's Interviews Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Roberta Mullen, today's host, joining you from New Orleans at the inaugural Health IT Expo. Follow our show's hashtag, Interviews Now, and join the conversation. It is 2018, and we're nearing a decade since the largest ever and most say never again federal initiative and financial investment in moving our healthcare system from paper to digital. How far have we come, and where should we be looking to go? I'm here today at the inaugural Health IT Expo in New Orleans to talk to some of the most respected thought leaders in our industry to get their perspectives on our road ahead. But first, let's begin with one of the event founders, John Lynn. Hi, John. Hey, how are you doing? Great. I'm going to be talking to people tomorrow, but today I want to get your insight on exactly what this event is all about. But first, tell us, what was the inspiration to, for having this event? Well, as a health IT blogger for 12 years, everyone always told me, why don't you host your own event? And for me, I didn't want to create another Me Too event that replicated what other people were already doing. So I avoided it for the longest time. But eventually, I, I finally discovered a unique thing that would benefit healthcare in general and how could we be able to take all of these practical innovations and technology and put them to work in healthcare to improve the healthcare system. And I think that was a unique angle that we were looking at with Health IT Expo is how can we, rather than just celebrating successes, which is what most conferences do, or talking about platitudes that or moonshots that ne- aren't necessarily what the health IT professionals need, how can we make it more practical for them and provide practical innovations that will actually improve their health system? So what are your expectations for the show? Well, we're excited because one of the trademarks of a healthcare scene event is we want to create a community of people at the event. It's not just enough for us to come together for two days, have fun, and then go back and nothing actually happens. We want to start an, a community where people are actually sharing at the event, but then also well beyond the event, whether it's on the hashtag hit expo, where they're sharing ideas and they're connecting and they're, sh- you know, they're connecting with each other to be able to solve each other's problems. One of the first slides we're going to start with tomorrow when we really kick off the event, we're going to put up a slide that says vulnerability is not weakness. And that's part of creating a community. If you want to create a valuable community of users, you need to be okay to be able to be vulnerable. But the reality is when we show our vulnerability, the rest of the community can rally around you and provide you the support you need to turn that weakness into a strength. So that's my goal for this inaugural event is to start this community, to create that culture of sharing, of giving before you get, and supporting each other. Well, we are really looking forward to the show, and you you have a great slate of speakers and people just coming to it. And uh, you've had some very good success with building a community. So I think you know what you're doing, and I'm wishing you good luck. Thanks. Appreciate you being here and covering the event. I'm here with Nick Venero, co-founder of Capto Consulting. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? Good, Roberta. Thank you. Uh, where are you coming from? I came in from Connecticut. Connecticut. You are speaking this afternoon at an event, and I understand you're leading a presentation on outcomes-based contracts. Can you tell us what inspired this topic? Um, yeah, Roberta. Early, early in my career, and this was actually just mentioned in the keynote opening uh, address, and that is that oftentimes you see relationships between uh, the suppliers and the buyers become adversarial or a zero-sum game, and that always leads to problems and uh, sourcing, and there's just so many better ways that the relationship can be developed, and an outcomes-based model is one of those ways, and we've seen that be successful uh, in a number of engagements, uh, and that's, that, that's kind of the genesis of how it, uh, of how it started for me. What steps can health IT leaders take to form more strategic partnerships? Well, I think first and foremost is to understand what you're buying and what your outcomes you want to achieve. Uh, Oftentimes I see senior leaders begin with some very 
good outcomes, very good ideas on what they want to achieve with their uh, sourcing strategy. And that might be innovation. It could be cost reduction. Uh, it might be increasing quality. It could be faster time to market. But oftentimes you see those very good ideas begin to go by the boards as the project develops in the relationship between the, the sourcing partner and the, uh, and the buyer becomes more adversarial, like I mentioned earlier, or oftentimes just focused on cost reduction. And what happens is that once you start down that path, you begin to lose sight of those important outcomes that you wanted to get very early on and you just sort of forget about it as it as the as the deal develops so what we try to help our customers focus on is maintaining uh the notion of those outcomes being crisp about what it is you want to accomplish and then keep that in the forefront as you develop those strategic relationships with your with your partners what type of businesses are your your clients? Um, we have two main uh, sets of clients. Capto is a boutique management consulting company. We're uh, on, on one side of the house where uh, we work with uh, M&A deals, uh, merger and acquisition. On the other side, we work with Fortune 500 companies in two main areas. Uh, one is telecommunications, media, entertainment, clients like AT&T, uh, DirecTV, uh, Time Warner Cable, and on the other side of the house is healthcare. And there we work with large insurance companies, hospitals, practice management systems. So the big players. Big players. The big yeah. players. Yeah. Typically well, always Fortune 500. Well, your topic sounds like it's a good fit for this new Health IT Expo. It should be. I mean, I was really uh, encouraged when uh, it was part of the kickoff of the uh, of this event and just talking about how we have to look for win-win relationships and uh, moving away from a zero-sum game. So I'm hoping I'm hoping that to be the case. Yeah. I really appreciate you taking time out today, Nick. Thank you. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. Here with me, I have Lee Horner. He's a CEO of Senzi. Hi, Lee. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you very much for having me, Roberta. So Senzi is in the virtual care space. Yes, we're focused on caring for folks using virtual technology to really bridge the gap from an in-person experience to something that's more on the virtual care side. So you tend to speak about the concept of virtual care rather than telehealth. Can you explain what it is and how it differs from what we think of traditional telehealth? Sure. So, you know, uh, from the onset of our organization, we were really looking at ways to solve problems with video type of technology. And ultimately, you know, what we saw is the telehealth word being used in the industry as kind of a broad umbrella type of approach. And many folks, you know, have entered this industry with trying to solve problems using the word telehealth. But the reality is, uh, whether that's, you know, uh, mobile or audio based, our real value and what we're trying to drive into the market under virtual care is really trying to put a set of eyes on the patient uh, and making sure that we're delivering high quality of care through something that uh, allows individuals to communicate as if they were in person face to face. How can someone get in touch with you on the web? So we're at www.sinzi.com. That's S-Y-N-Z-I and Sinzi. Thanks, Glee, for joining us. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Here with me is Shah Zamad, Vice President of Cloud Operations and Delivery of Nextgate. Hi, Shah. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you very much. So your subject that you're talking about today at this event is EMPI. And I want, before we start talking about it, I want you to explain what it is. Well, certainly. So EMPI is the Enterprise Master Patient Index. In, in, in a nutshell, it is um, the one backbone of the system that would help identify all the patients' records correctly and help with the duplication issue that all hospitals and medical facilities have. So how can organizations take advantage of innovations, including the cloud computing, to improve patient matching and effectively manage their EMPI? So it's a, it's a 
there are multiple answers to the question, uh, of course. The, the fact of the matter is that EMPI in itself needs to be managed. And every hospital, every medical facility, they tend to have some sort of master patient index that they do manage today anyway. Where the power of the cloud is coming in, if you choose a good EMPI that is sitting at the enterprise level and uh, connecting with various systems in the hospital or in a healthcare setting, um, it really needs to be managed by subject matter experts, people who know what they're doing, people who've developed the system, like uh, our organization, um, we've developed the software, we've been out there for 20 plus years and uh, people understand the uh, the concept, people understand the benefit the, the software provides. But what we are doing as, as part of the cloud is using, leveraging the, um, uh, the, the infinite capacity of the cloud in itself and uh, eliminating the need of worrying about the hardware for the healthcare organizations, not having to think about what to do, um, how to stand up the servers or the databases and things like those. We're taking all of those away from them and providing them this um, one-stop shop uh, EMPI solution, which really becomes like a true service for the um, healthcare organizations themselves so they don't have to worry about this one piece of software and they can focus on their uh, day jobs. So EHRs, they don't properly handle this, or they do in a certain sense? Why would someone need this extra layer? Uh, good question. So EHR uh, tend to have a master patient index, um, but they fail quite miserably uh, because the system is designed to only manage the patient, patients within their own system in itself. And we tend to have a, um, this variety of systems that are being used in the hospital. Uh, the data comes in from... 60,000 different places um, uh, from the labs to the other systems and, 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 and as the collaboration continues um, the, the data is coming coming in from various systems, data is going out through various systems as well and because the EHR tend to use one single um, uh, master patient index, it's not an enterprise one so it doesn't link to um, all of those systems and ends up actually, um, fun fact for you um, ends up actually contributing to the patient duplication issue instead of helping. And so you really need an enterprise level product that sits on top of everything else and then really collaborates and not only uh, um, match the incoming data fees but also be able to send the matched record downstream to the systems and so um, kill it or fix it at source. Mm -hmm. So this is another good solution to our interoperability problem in making it better. It is the solution uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to patient matching, absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us. If you're just joining us, I'm at the inaugural Health IT Expo in New Orleans, talking with thought leaders who are sharing insights on our healthcare system's journey to digital. With me now is a longtime friend and colleague, Brian Johnson, Senior Director of Online Education at Format Approved. Hi, Brian. It's great to see you again in person. Hi, Roberta. It's great to see you, too. I'm really uh, having a lovely time here at the conference. So many interesting subjects covered and so many interesting people as well. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about Format Approved and their services? Sure. It'd be my pleasure. Format Approved offers uh, accredited online courses and workshops that are focused on health IT, so it just makes sense for us to be here at the Health IT Expo. Our courses are... Uh, pragmatic, meant for real-world use. So we cover subjects that are difficult to find anywhere else, and then we get those accredited for uh, doctors, CMEs, and nurse CEUs, so that clinicians, but also a lot of other folks who are you know, in the IT world or in the consulting world can get the most out of those courses. And that's, uh, but we're very narrowly focused on health IT, and there's not a lot of folks who focus on that area. Yeah, that's right. You are so hands-on. I know that you even um, monitor and teach some of the security courses, but you're so hands-on on the actual training. What topics do you see trending in demand these days in health IT? Well, you know, one of the subjects that seems to be the buzzword of the year, and people are talking about it here at the conference, is blockchain. So we just delivered and had our first set of workshops on the blockchain subject, and those were accredited. So you won't find that very many places. We also are training around ransomware because ransomware has hit healthcare so hard 
And in fact, I was reading earlier this year that healthcare is now the number one target of ransomware attack. So we have accredited training on that as well, because when it comes to things like ransomware, it's really important for people to be properly trained to avoid infecting networks. Beyond that, you know, we're always working on macro MIPS because CMS seems to change the program every 15 or 20 minutes. And we just made a huge set of changes to that course because they renamed ACI to Promoting Interoperability, as people may know. So there's a lot of interest in, in security as we continue to go down that road of improving security for healthcare, but also these new forms of delivering security, at least potentially, like blockchain, and beyond that, the ever-changing world of Medicare reimbursement. That's right. So do you find it different, like who's going for the education, the types of education? Do you find it different on the provider and the clinical side than then on the support and administrative type staff? So are they looking for different types of training or areas of training? Well, one of the things that I love about uh, the training that we are able to offer to people is that we have a very diverse audience. So we have clinicians, we have consultants, we have support staff, we have IT people. And to be honest, a, a lot of it does go across clinicians and other types of people in healthcare when it comes to, because it depends on what they're trying to do, really. When it comes to trying to understand macro MIPS, there's all kinds of people who need to try to understand that. So we'll have clinicians in there, but we'll also have consultants and other people. I guess where there might be some difference is that the non-clinicians tend to be a little bit more focused on security and compliance issues. <clears throat> so for clinicians, you might see, you know, training to a certain level of proficiency, but they're not going to take the kind of deep dive on subjects like cybersecurity. That's another one we just updated because uh, NIST just came out with a new cybersecurity framework. So those subjects, there are definitely like clinicians who are interested in those subjects, but they tend not to pursue them quite as much as the consultants and the IT people do because they're the ones who are really most often trying to protect us. Well, on the big picture here, everything keeps changing, no matter what the subject matter is in healthcare IT. It keeps changing. So, That's very true. So, so one of the big takeaways from this should be that if you got trained a year ago, then start looking at what's going on today. That is so true. I'm glad you said that. And it's really amazing. I mean, as I was saying, whether it's NIST updating its cybersecurity framework or macro MIPS changing the program significantly, CMS has changed the program in just the last year, you really have to keep up on these subjects or you will fall behind so fast. It's, it's kind of can make your head spin. That's but right. it's also what's great about going to these uh, conferences as well. And why I'm having such a good time here is to see what people are doing and how they're thinking about these things, people who are really on the cutting edge of this of these subjects. Well, and a lot of this directly impacts your bottom line as practices go and everything else. So you have oh, to very much. Yeah. Well, again, it was great to see you in person. We don't get to see enough of each other. No, we talk fairly often, but we don't see each other in the flesh that often. I suppose that's how it is in the in the world today. And it was very good to see you. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Brian, and hope to see you at next year's expo. Definitely. I'm here with Mike Semmel. He's the president of Semmel Consulting and best-selling author of How to Avoid HIPAA Headaches. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Great, Rupert. It's great to be here. So, why did you write this book? Well, I wrote the book to fill a void. When it comes to HIPAA, a lot of people say that they have read the laws and the rules and they think they know it. And what I did was take the uh, penalties, take lawsuits, all sorts of incidents that have happened that have caused problems for people related to HIPAA, and I deconstructed them down to what the root causes were and what organizations can do to avoid those themselves. So tell us a little bit about how a practice really knows if they are secure and HIPAA compliant. Well, the simple way is to apply the same types of methods that you would do for a patient. So if a patient came in for an exam, the doctor would ask the patient how they feel. And even if they said good, the doctor wouldn't take that at face value. The doctor would have the patient go through blood tests and maybe urine tests and MRIs and all sorts of diagnostics and then make a decision based on what the data shows. Same thing with compliance and IT security. You need to have someone come in and apply the same kinds of methods. Find out what's going on by asking and observing, but also run some under-the-skin, in this case, the skin of the network tests, 
to find out what's really going on. Are file servers patched and updated? Are users managed properly? When we do assessments, we've shown our clients where they have users that may not have been employed there for more than a year that still had access to their networks. They've told us in their questionnaires that everybody is current and up to date and we found otherwise. So just like a doctor diagnosing a patient, you want to do it based on data and not just what they believe. Well, Mike, it was great catching up with you again. We hadn't seen each other in a while, but it was great catching up. Thanks, and it's great to talk to you too, Roberta. I'm here with Adam Class. He is the CTO of Vigilance. Hi, Adam. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. How's the show going for you? Well, it's been great. It's been very informative. I've uh, heard some really great speakers and uh, looking forward to the next sessions. And you're speaking this afternoon. I am. I That's am. great. So we're going to talk about sepsis today. And sepsis is something that is very dangerous because it goes virtually undetected and escalates pretty quickly. There are predictive tools like your company has. And how would something like this help hospitals and clinicians in identifying and diagnosing this sooner? Sure. So what, what Vigilance has developed is a really sort of an advanced clinical surveillance platform. Uh, so what we try to do is we try to automate a lot of the manual data collection processes that clinicians are having to do on a daily basis by bringing in clinical information from the electronic health record and writing intelligent rules against that data so we can alert the clinicians to patients that are in need. What we've also been able to do with this platform is is put in machine learning, so really being able to look at what's coming around the corner. And using machine learning models, we've been able to develop a process where we can bring in this real-time clinical data on the patient and process this information and actually score the patient's and let the clinicians know that with a very high positive predictive value that it looks as if this patient is going to become septic. So what we're able to do is get is get this type of prediction into the clinical workflow um, so they're able to identify those patients sooner uh, before it becomes too late. Excellent. Thank you for joining me, Adam. Oh, you're very welcome. The first Health IT Expo has come to a close, and I'm here with Colin Hung, one of the event founders. Hi, Colin. Thanks for joining me. Hey, great to be here, Roberta. So how did the event meet your expectations? I think it definitely exceeded our expectations. Uh, It is hard these days to put on a conference in a crowded market. And, you know, as you know, there are plenty of other health IT conferences out there. So in terms of attendance, in terms of feedback, in terms of uh, just overall uh, uptake of the event, we're very, very pleased and exceeded all of our expectations. That's great. I had a great time. What were a couple of highlights you'll be taking away from the expo? A couple of highlights, I think, was one, the real focus on security. There were definitely a lot of talk about security and the need for it. I definitely take will take that away as it's high on a lot of people's priority lists. Um, the other thing that I'll take away from the expo is just how many people were really happy or refreshed that they were at a, a conference where they could really ask questions. Uh, and really get some of their questions answered. So to me, the the, the combination of security plus the fact that people were actually getting some questions answered uh, will be my takeaways from the expo. Yeah, I realized after that event that bigger doesn't mean better. Yeah, I think that was, that. you're right. I mean, it, it was really nice to be able to see the same people over and over again over the two days. You know, we can see them at lunch, you can see them at a break. And so that sort of allowed you to have a much a stronger connection and a better conversation, I think, rather than, you know, being one of tens of thousands. But those shows are good too, but I think the intimacy really helped, especially for the sponsors and especially for people who are really seeking out specific answers or specific uh, expertise. It really allowed for that connection. Yeah, you had better conversations. You weren't passing as ships in the night very quickly. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So another of your founding partners, John Lynn, who I spoke to at the beginning of the conference a couple days ago, spoke about starting a community, not just another conference. So were those seeds planted and did you see a willingness to become a community? Um, I think so. Uh, you know, we spoke to a few uh, CIOs of hospitals that had come to the event uh, they were all sort of very pleasantly surprised at the fact that it wasn't sort of too salesy and, and, you know, there wasn't a big giant exhibit hall and things like that. But what really impressed them was their ability to connect with fellow CIOs 
but and also connect with thought leaders from these vendors in a very sort of non salesy non pitch kind of environment so uh, you know and that plus the fact that it was you know very small and very intimate and so those connections could be made i think the seeds were planted um I think John's message, you know, when he opened the conference around, hey, this is a sort of a no BS environment. This is an environment where, you know, hey, if we're just telling you a platitude, call us out on that. So I think that openness really set the tone. And I think that was definitely carried through the two days. So I think we have this. We definitely have the seeds of the community. And now it's the challenge for us is to actually nurture it, you know, is to actually grow that community. That's right. So your other community, everybody identifies with is HitMic. How will you identify this community beyond the expo? So it's interesting, you know, the, the comparison obviously was with our other community, Hitmic. You know, Hitmic for the first year was just sort of like, oh, it's just a conference and, you know, everyone scattered to the wind after that. But, you know, there was a, there was a core group of people that, that really remained in con- contact with one another. Uh, they, you know, they connected with each other through social media. We kept in contact with them. And I see the same thing happening with he- Expo. But we're going to do things like we're going to revamp the websites. We're going to do some things to try and encourage people to connect via community. We're going to do like a LinkedIn group and, and, and those kinds of things. But there is already a core of people who met at Expo who are connecting outside of us. And, and that's the sort of formation of the community. So what we're trying to do now is build tools, uh, build opportunities to allow more people to connect. And then, you know, we'll kind of let it grow organically. We're not, you can't really force a community. You can just really provide uh, the environment where a community can thrive. That's right. So we are calling this Hit Expo. Is that the community? Well, yeah, but for now it is Hit, hit Expo. It's okay. kind of weird, but, but <laughs> as fine. a community name, but uh, maybe one day we'll come up with a better one. But for now, yes, it's under the uh, Hit Expo kind of hashtag and moniker. That's, that's good. Yeah. Well, social media kind of moves you to branding you don't necessarily like, but it's there, right? It's identifiable, <laughs> right? Okay. So are there plans in the works for the second annual Expo and what can you share about them? Uh, yeah, so there's definitely plans for a second expo now and next year. The plans, you know, we're, we're, we're almost finalizing the plans in terms of location and venue and so forth. I guess what I can share is that, you know, we are going to do it on the, um, on the East Coast next year. Uh, and we're going to do it uh, at a time that maybe is a bit better than the one we chose this year. I mean, being in New Orleans was fantastic, but being in New Orleans at sort of the end of May was uh, a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> a, a little bit tough for some people, right. uh, and so we're going to try to choose a better time for the event uh, next year. And so we're taking a lot of the feedback that we got from this year's event, kind of applying it to next year. So yeah, we're getting pretty excited about that, and planning will start sooner than later <laughs> to get that one off the ground. That's right. And people should go out to Expo dot Health. So stay tuned to Expo dot Health, and we'll be announcing soon where the location and the dates uh, that you should reserve and put on your calendars for next year's event. That's great. Well, thanks for joining us and sharing with us today, Colin. All right. Thank you, Roberto. It's been great. And thank you all for those who shared their time and experiences with us. And thank you for tuning in today. For more information about interviews now, visit our show's program page on healthcarenowradio.com. And until next time, if it's happening in healthcare and it's now, it's on interviews now. 